the, the key point I make to the Australian beekeepers is treatments are a stopgap measure, only to yeah. hold the line until you develop resistant uh, bees, that bees. Bees that are resistant yeah. to mites and can do the job themselves. And that's, that's a tough thing to do because of the reproductive biology of the honeybee. This is Mike from Aussie Mike's Bees, and welcome to another interview with a world expert on bees, and in particular, our dreaded varroa mite that's just hit Australia in the last couple of years. Here we are with Randy Oliver. For those that don't know uh, who Randy Oliver is, there's a few of you left. I'll ask Randy now to give us a little <laughs> rundown. I got, I've been really interested to ask Randy your background, where you started in bees are you from a long-term bee family or okay. were you the first and then education and so on so uh sure hit, hit the road there well i was a naturalist from childhood grew up in an, in an area southern california before it was developed uh lived out in nature uh was crazy about bugs and plants and fish and everything uh elementary school uh junior high school um really got into the into the science my favorite book when i was was young were my uh father's college textbooks in biology by the time i entered junior high school my favorite book was culture methods for invertebrate animals and um, <laughs> um when i was 14 uh i um picked up a swarm uh in a neighbor's property had no idea what i was doing um put on a face mask and a sweatshirt and <laughs> put them in a cardboard box and didn't know what to do with them. So my, um, uh, one of my classmates at school, their father was a sideline beekeeper, older guy with a bad back. I was a young guy with a strong back. So I learned beekeeping the traditional way by apprenticing to an experienced beekeeper as a teenager. I went on to get uh, degrees in uh, uh, biology, specializing in entomology, and then uh, um, applied to graduate school and um, didn't get where I wanted, but they had a, a need for somebody with with uh, invertebrate culture in uh, fisheries biology. So I got into fisheries biology, and and from that got very much into animal nutrition and 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 um, uh, you know, bi biology. There uh, also ran a farm store, uh, so got into animal and plant nutrition uh, there. And then um, when Varroa. I, I went back to apply to get a PhD in apiculture at University of California, and I knew the, huh? uh, the, the professor in charge, Dr. Uh, Norm Gary, who has still been a close friend ever since then. And he said, oh, Randy, fantastic. I'd love to have you come in, and because uh, uh, I'd already taken a class from him and knew him. Uh, he says, but um, there's no jobs for anybody with a PhD in apiculture right now, <laughs> just so you know. I had a family of two kids, and I said, oh, dang, and I was... I was building yeah. houses at the time. I was a, um, a, a, a contractor. I go, I guess I'm going to keep contracting and I'll um, start building up my beekeeping business, which I did until I could finally quit contracting and just have my beekeeping business. And then Varroa might hit. And, oh, uh, yeah. So what year was that? that? That was 1993. Now, we had already had tracheo might hit us. That killed 70% of the hives in California. Yeah. It was devastating. But within a, a very few years, um, uh, there was innate resistance in the uh, population that we could select for, and nature selected for, because dead colonies tend not to breed. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, beekeepers sometimes pat themselves on the back for selective breeding, but nature has a very strong selective breeding also, <laughs> since it eliminates the, uh, those that have a problem. Um, uh, and I thought, and I had bred for foul brood resistance. That was relatively easy to breed for bees that are 100% resistant to foul brood. And yeah. uh, I'd bred for other things. And I thought, oh, no big deal. I'll breed for varroa resistant bees. Well, that turned out to be harder. Varroa resistance was a harder thing to breed for. Sure has. And then we went through the, um, when, and varroa uh, wiped me out. Um, I gave it up, abandoned my hives for a year. It was just devastating. Just so terrible to see all your colonies die from. Wow, that would be something. soul destroying. And then the uh, a beekeeper friend said, hey, there's these little plastic strips you can put into your, your beehive, the apistan strips, 
and you can actually keep bees alive. And sure enough, I tried them, went out and scraped a wax moth out of 250 hives and uh, uh, put in apostan strips and um, was able to uh, keep bees again. And then, um, oh, after about six years, the mites developed resistance to apistan. Um, we tried, <coughs> they registered uh, organophosphate, which they were trying to phase out, cumafos, and um, I tried that one year and said, wow, this stuff is nasty. That's something I don't want to put into my beehive. <coughs> and I stopped using it. Now, cumafos failed within three years. Um, so I got off the uh, synthetic pesticide bandwagon back in 20, 2001. We haven't right. used a synthetic pesticide, miticide, in our operation since the year 2001. Wow, we, that's we really run a, encouraging. a commercial operation in California. We do almond pollination. We have to have, we've fulfilled our contracts every single yep. year since, yep. since then. Um, and uh, went through the learning curve of how to use the, uh, the what they call the natural treatments, organic acids and uh, uh, thymol, and um, occasionally the hop guard too. <coughs> And it's been a learning curve. Um, and the commercial industry, when Kumafos and Fuvalne failed, shifted to Amitraz. And worldwide, that has been the treatment. And most all countries are totally dependent upon Amitraz. There's um, uh, uh, Iran, uh, I was just talking to beekeepers there in Iran, and um, they haven't gotten to Amitraz yet. They're, they're still using Fumethrin and Fuvalne. Um, but we know what's going to happen because it follows the same path in every single country. Sure. Um, but those few countries that never got on the synthetic chemicals, such as South Africa and Cuba, they their colonies all have varroa, but they don't pay any attention to it. They don't consider it to be a, a, a major problem. Uh, to right, them. so it never reaches a threshold where it affects their health. Uh, apparently, uh, is is a dynamics between the <coughs> the mites and whatever viruses are there. Yes. So depending on what viruses you have available, and eventually you're going to get all the viruses. Um, of course. Um, uh, the colonies have figured out how to keep mites at fairly low levels, <coughs> not as low as with Apis serrana, the native host. The Apis serrana made a deal with Varroa <laughs> as a species. And it set some really, really strict ru rules upon the mite and said, we will allow you to be a minor parasite in our hives, but if you cause any trouble at all, um, no, you're, you're, you're dead. And, um, yep. uh, and they have a really beautiful system to manage Varroa in Apis serrana colonies. Now, Apis mellifera often chooses different paths. They use some of the same mechanisms and only recently have um, there's a, a mechanism that Apis serrana uses of this social apoptosis of the larvae. So when the larva, fifth instar bee larva, first yep. gets bitten by a mite, the mite injects some saliva. In that yep. saliva is a specific protein that the larvae recognize and they put out a pheromone that says, sacrifice me. And <laughs> if, if the nurses don't sacrifice them, they may just sacrifice them themselves. But generally it's the nurses that will uh, sacrifice them. That's called social apoptosis. That prevents Varroa from successfully reproducing in the worker brood of Apis serrana. Yes. I suggested doing a bioassay for that in the United States back in 2016 when that information came out, and they just published the first paper just now, this, uh, this last month, that they actually After are over 10 years? So, you know, it, it takes a while sometimes to get the government agencies moving. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, yep, good. Anyway, that's a bioassay that I would strongly suggest you Australian researchers uh, yeah. use in order to see whether there is innate resistance um, already there. What, here's the thing we found is that when you're breeding for varroa resistance, you're not, you're not creating anything new when you do selective breeding. For something new, you need either a mutation, so you could do yeah. gamma irradiation or something, try to get mutations, but most all mutations are deleterious. Or you could hybridize, so you could bring in, try to cross two different species and get some new alleles or, um, or, or in. That's unlikely to, to happen. And Apis mellifera tends to have all the tools it needs to control Varroa already in its genome. 
but at a right. very, very low level. So right. for selective breeding, what you're doing, you just you have to identify those colonies that exhibit the tr the ability to thwart mite reproduction, and then just breed from them. So back uh, 2017, um, I started uh, doing that. I got serious about it. first the first mistake people make is they okay, well we'll bring in resistance stock from here and resistance stock from here and resistance stock from here and we'll mate them all together and a miracle will happen in our <laughs> bee yard. And I said, that's ridiculous. That's like taking, going to the Grand Prix and taking the best, fastest Ferrari car, the best Porsche and the best Mercedes, taking them apart, scrambling up all their parts and putting them together. <laughs> and you wind up with a pile of shit. Okay, yeah. same thing. You can't just bring in, magic's not gonna happen. It's not about making new con new uh, a new combination of resistant traits is of narrowing it down and eliminating all the non-resistant ones so uh, yes. what we did is when we finally started i finally got it started getting serious about varroa resistance so what what happened is when varroa started getting hard i said hey you know i've got degrees in entomology why am i letting the mite kick my butt <laughs> so I went back, started self-educating. So that, that finishes off that story. I self-educated, uh, read all the scientific literature, talked to all the researchers, got up to date, and got a really deep understanding of varroa and, and the honeybee biologically. And then I spent a whole year developing my varroa model, uh, which is a free download. And yep. in order to model an organism, you need to understand the biology of the organism at a very, very deep level. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. By the time I was finally got my Varroa model accurately predicting what you could expect with mite buildup, I really had an understanding of Varroa. And Varroa's Achilles heel is its ability to successfully reproduce. On the average, a foundress mite, that's the female mite that yep. is mated, enters a cell, that's called the foundress mite. Yep. On average, in most populations in the world, non-resistant populations, she has an average of about one and a half mated daughters that successfully emerge from a cell. So in a, a reproductive turn, a cycle, which is about 17, 20 days, something like that, yep. that foundress has one and a half daughters, mated daughters that actually survive. But the Succeed, foundress is right. only good for maybe two or three re reproductive cycles. If you cut that rate of success in half, mites will disappear from your hive. That would be yeah. negative population growth and they will just dwindle away of natural mortality. So that their, more, their, the, um, their attrition rate, their natural death rate, which is about 1%. Um, right, could, could I um, ask, yeah. we've been taught that it's uh, anything between like four or more successful daughters. So, no, there seems to be something wrong with that figure. In, in a drone brood cell, they could get ah, maybe it, maybe right. maybe at four, maybe the, four. The key thing is, it's successful mated daughters. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, she, she's she's right. going to have four daughters, but they're not going to survive once the cell comes open. Most of uh, them so they'll die. just drop. They just drop. Right. Yeah, either they dry up or they, or they drop because because they're so not one and enough. a half successful successfully mated daughters right. from workers or in a worker cell at, right yeah okay good so, thanks okay so cut that in half and the mite population just dwindles away sure uh, so we, we, when you're doing a treatment what you're doing is um, an extended treatment you can cause the mite population to to dwindle so the the two ways of doing it is you do you hit them with a, a, a hard-acting treatment, a short-term treatment, uh, like one of the synthetic miticides or formic acid, very rapid-acting treatment. Formic can be overnight. Uh, the formic acid treatment, if you apply it, I'm not suggesting that anybody break the law in Australia. No. It's not an approved method there. Randy Oliver is not suggesting anybody break the law. How's that? Okay, I covered my back. Thank you. Okay. Yep. <laughs> but the flash treatment, where you simply um, pour like 65% or 50% formic acid on a pad or on a uh, uh, lid, like a fume board lid, and put it on at dusk by morning, it's all gone and the treatment's done and you've killed. Completely evaporates. 
It's completely, completely evaporated, gone, no, no, out, out of your hive. You, you can control the mites overnight. Now, at that h high a level, you may lose your, your queen. So it's, it's a trade-off with formic acid, it's tricky. But you can do, you, one way to work with Varroa, you let the mite population build up and you knock it way down, then it builds up, knock right. it down. The other way, that's called reactive treatment. What we use is proactive management. Right. We get our mite population down close to zero or zero in the, now zero doesn't mean there's no mites in the hive. It just means no, they're non-detectable with a mite wash. Okay. Sure. So we want to get down to zero counts first thing in the spring prior to swarm season. So, uh, swarm season is when the mites reproduce most efficiently. Uh, everything yes. is perfect for mite reproduction at swarm season. It's harder the rest yeah, of the year for them to reproduce. That's a huge supply of, of uh, larvae to As you climb have, into and begin. Right. Yeah. Have, plus the most amount of drones, plus the best ratio of brood to adult bees. So the mites, it's very easy for the mites to find a cell to enter. So if you can start off the year um, prior to, um, to get the mites down before that, that uh, accelerated reproduction during swarm season, that helps you a whole lot. And then you just manage, you, you don't get by with just one treatment a year. So initially, um, with fluvalinate, the apistan strips, we can get by with one treatment a year. You can let the mites build up all season long by right. uh, the end of the season, by fall. I'm not going to say months because you guys are backwards from us. No, no, we're different. Yeah. Yeah. So by fall, you can have a mite on every bee on the hive and treat it, and that colony would survive the winter. But that was uh -huh. before the viruses evolved to right. take advantage. Right. So we watched evolution before our eyes take place with this dynamic of, just like with COVID, the, the variants of viruses. And this happens with American, with foul brood, European foul brood, American foul brood, um, with chalk brood. There are ver continually variants. So like your chalk brood in Australia is slightly different yeah. than our chalk brood in California. The one year when we were importing Australian packages to California, I had just been in Australia the year before, seen your chalk brood, and I noted to the beekeeper I was with, your chalk brood looks a little bit different in the cells than ours does in California. Same, right. same fungus, but looks a little different. When the Australian packages got introduced to California, our California chalk brood ate them alive. Every I single no Australian defense. queen had to be killed and a California queen put in to get the colony to survive because there was no innate resistance to the California strain of yes. chalk root. So you, there's, understand that these pathogens are continually, and, and parasites are continually evolving all, all the time. Yeah, and separately, as and you I, say. I tell beekeepers all the time, reasons. you know, they, I, I, when I'm presenting on my selective breeding for varroa, for resistance, I said, you guys have very, been very successful. You should pack, pat yourselves on the back. You are all engaged yourselves in a selective breeding program for mites that are resistant to whatever miticide you're using, and you've been very successful at doing that miticide after miticide. So, so be proud of yourselves <laughs> and what a good job you've done in, on breeding for miticide-resistant mites. Um, yeah. so, so that's gonna, that's, that is what happens, okay? Right. That, um, by continually using, and, and they make the mistake of not rotating the treatments. They find one treatment that works, and if you want to breed for resistant mites, you just keep using the same treatment over and over again. And at first, it may be once a year we'll do it for you. But then you find out, oh, we, no, well, now we got to do it twice a year. Like with Amitraz, when beekeepers first started using it with Varroa, once a year was enough. Then it was twice a year, and then three times a year. And now many beekeepers are using it up to 10 times a year, okay, to get the same wow. amount of control of, of Varroa. So uh, the mites are, are becoming much more resistant to the amateurs. And this is, I just got back from, from France, um, and they're saying the same thing in all the, all the Mediterranean climates, that um, the, uh, the amateurs is not working any, anymore. And uh, right. so they're having to shift over, um, having to shift to the oxalic acid and the formic acid. Same thing happening in the United States. In the commercial industry, it was 100% amitraz, amitraz, amitraz for the last quite a few years. Um, much of it and off label use. Um, of course, that ramping up to 10 times what they used to, 10 times a year, that's gotta be 
hugely expensive. It, it, it Not, is. They use a an off-label, illegal, cheaper uh, treatment. But, it, the but it's still labor. Still, still labor. Exactly. There's still the labor cost of doing it. And it sets the colony back a little bit every time you put it in. It's not an easy miticide on the colony. Yeah. And you contaminate your, your combs. So um, it has yeah. an effect on the queens. It has an effect on, on the bees. Okay? So there, there's no, no free lunch on this. The miticides all have effect on the, on the colony, including the natural treatments. They also have effects on the colony but they tend not to contaminate the combs. So the, the point is, you've got to rotate treatments. Um, otherwise, you're, get, you're developing breeding for resistance. Now, the, the key point I make to the Australian beekeepers is treatments are a stopgap measure, only to yeah. hold the line until you develop resistant uh, bees, without bees, bees that are resistant yeah. to mites and can do the job themselves. And that's, that's a tough thing to do because of the reproductive biology of the honeybee. If you want yeah. to choose the one species on earth that is the most difficult species to selectively breed, it's probably the honeybee. Because sure of its, thing. its polyandry, the queen mating with you know, up to 40 drones, okay? That doesn't happen with cattle or sheep or breeding for corn. You can do- That you can keep in a paddock. <laughs> yes, you, you can control those matings. The second thing is the very high rate of genetic recombination which means that when the queen is making an egg cell, that she swaps some alleles from the, from the chromosomes of her father with those of her mother and comes up with new combinations. So those new combinations are also, they, they help create new combinations, but they also can make it harder to selectively breed. Uh, the, the third thing is the sex, sex determination gene. And that's what really prevents you from doing the inbreeding or line breeding that you do with all other plants and livestock. You can mate a father to a daughter. You can mate a father to a niece. You can mate, mate a, a niece and a nephew together. You can't do that with honeybees. Otherwise, you yeah. wind up losing sex alleles and you get diploid drones. So all those things make honeybees very, very difficult to selectively breed. The other thing is controlling your matings. So there's nobody with 10 colonies that's ever going to be able to selectively breed for anything because you're going to have, especially, and you guys with your, your feral population there, um, unless you can get control, like uh, what's that, that island you have over in West Australia? Kangaroo, Kangaroo Island. Island yeah. So when yep. you, you have an island, yes, you could do selective breeding over there. So, sure. so what I did here is essentially created an island um, uh, with, with in, involving 1,500 hives in a selective breeding program, replacing all of our queens every single year and only breeding off of 2% of them every year, eliminating 98% of them, their genetics every year. Not, not their, all their genetics, but those that don't make the grade, their combination yep. of genetics does not get reproduced the next year, only right, from the 2% that did it. Now, luckily, the genetics of the drone population reflect the genetics of two generations back. Okay. Yes. So that keeps you from from doing too much bottlenecking of the of of the genome and the sex alleles, and it slows down your progress, but it prevents you from from losing too many too much genetic diversity. So far, we haven't seen any problem with loss of genetic diversity in our operation, and we're. I realized this spring when I um, asked my sons, uh, my sons now run the operation, but the agreement was that I have whatever number of colonies I want any time for research. So I was going to do some big projects of testing um, some oxalic acid formulations. You can't mm -hmm. test a miticide uh, uh, for efficacy on a colony that's resistant to the mites. Yeah, of course. So I need to have non-resistant colonies to test. So I told my sons, this spring, when after almond pollination, we split all of our hives. I said, save all of last year's queens, the ones that were not labeled as potential mite resistant breeders, okay? And put them in a nuke, let them build up, don't treat them for mites, let them build up. 
And then I can, in a couple of months, I'll be able to see which ones are non-resistant, that the mites are going up, which I could use in my trial. So in June, or I should say in our early summer, they went out and mite washed them, and they came back and said, oh, bad news, Dad. Not enough, <laughs> too many zero counts and not, not, not enough mites. That's oh, a, what a problem to have. That's, that was our problem this spring. So we waited for another month until uh, after the summer solstice and washed them again and barely found enough colonies for my test. I had to go down to some very low mite counts to include in the test because we did not have enough colonies building up mites to the degree expected. That opened my eyes and I realized we have been greatly underestimating our progress because we were treating a lot of colonies that did not need treatment in our breeding yeah. program. Uh, just right. because of um, time saving, when the boys go out in, uh, we early summer, we used to be able to identify the breeders because the mite counts were going up high enough, um, you know, a mite, a mite wash count of 20 mites. Um, if you if if across the board of a an apiary, a large apiary, you have some colonies getting twenty mites and other colonies yep. showing zero, you can selectively breed. You have to have sure. variation. If they're all at zero, you can't do any selective breeding. Well, yeah. the la early on in this in our uh, demonstration project of doing this, this is a demonstration project for the benefit of the queen breeders. That's what I'm doing this for, to show yep. them, to test, not to show them anything to see if, it, if this, this will work. Anyway, early on, by June, it was very, or, I'm sorry, before the summer solstice, it was very easy for us to selectively breed. The last few years, uh, even by midsummer, we are having, uh, saying, the boys come back, go, okay, half the hives in this yard are showing zero counts. Do we have to keep washing them over and over for the rest of the year. And I go, oh no, pick out the best 10, label them as potential breeders, and then treat all the rest. Well, they've been treating a whole bunch of colonies that were resistant, and we just weren't paying attention to that. So what I realized is, wow, we have made way more progress than we thought. We're, our whole operation now is running somewhere in the ballpark of 50% of the colonies do not need a treatment, or maybe a light cleanup at the end of the of the season. Wow. A few yeah. yards, we're so just, pushing just 70 to clarify, of how, Yeah. Sorry, I'll get that again, but how long has this breeding program been going we're on We're going for? to our seventh year. Seventh year. So you've got a 50% no treat required in only seven years. Yeah. So now the big thing now is that um, we have a friend who's a very large commercial queen producer. And uh -huh. um, he needed bulk bees this spring after almond pollination to stock his mating nukes. So in California, there's a market for shaken bulk bees. I don't know if you have one. Yeah, you must have one for package bees there. I, I guess in the commercial world, I'm from the recreational okay. world. So. In California, in the springtime, you can call somebody up and say, yeah, I need 500 pounds of shaken bulk bees. And you can have them delivered. Yep, yep. Okay. So... He needed bulk bees, and he, so he asked my son, he says, hey, you got any uh, strong colonies and almonds that are getting ready to swarm? We'll go down and shake bulk bees out of them for you, and not only that, pay you for them. So we said, great. <laughs> good so, deal. So they yeah. did. We had a, a yard that was getting ready to swarm. They went down, shook the bulk bees out of them. Eric, got my son, got a nice fat check, was happy. What he didn't realize is the sons of my friend who are coming up in that operation were on the crew shaking them and came back and said, wow, Randy's hives look really good. <laughs> and so I get a call from, from the dad and he says, hey, would you like uh, to work with me so we could produce some of your stock commercially? I said, oh, no, no, because we need to control our meetings. We need to be able to stock our meeting yards. He goes, tell you what, we have exclusive access to a 20,000 acre ranch that we can control all the beehives. A bigger island. A big island, an inland island. Yeah, and I've, fantastic. I've Google mapped it and it is bar barren of beehives. So there's a single road going through the country and no other beekeepers can put bees on it. So this is, uh, and he says, you can stock it 
with your selected breeder, uh, drone mother colonies. Yep. And yep. you supply us the breeder queens, and then we'll do the grafting and the mating out um, only with your stock. And uh, I go, wow, this is like a dream come true. So this is, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a win win situation for the two of us that, um, yeah. Um, we're at our elevation, we're a little bit late to supply the commercial market for, uh, for, for production queens. Okay. Right. He's down in the valley where it's earlier and he's, he produces hundreds of thousands of, of queen bees. So he's, he's better in a better position. Suited. His whole business yeah. is producing queen bees. <clears throat> um, I right. told my son, I said, this is, this is your dream right here. You got somebody else to do that's specialized in selling the production queens, which does not work at our elevation very well, and it's a pain in the butt for us. Yeah. And we can focus on selective breeding. And uh, perfect. Yeah. So we're we're. That's a marriage made in heaven. It's a marriage <laughs> made in heaven, and, and I, I completely trust this uh, the, the breeder, the producer. So we're good friends. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's the important part. That, that's a very important part, right? So we're going to see what happens. So we're really excited. This will be the first time up till now when we are mating out the daughters of a uh, breeder queen. She's been mating yep. with a drone pool that we have not been able to select Control. other than just it's right. from our operation. So many of the drones came from non-resistant colonies, you know, uh, maybe 95% yep. of them in the first few years. The drones came from non-resistant colonies. Well, that's going to slow down sure. your breeding. This year, for the first time, all the drones are only going to come from chosen resistant colonies. So we're going to yes. see what that does. You know, I, I can't predict the future, but my guess is that's going to improve the arith arithmetic on the, <laughs> on, on the meeting. So uh, very it sure exciting. It sounds that way. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this Queen Brady you've teamed up with supplies a substantial number of um, commercial operators throughout the around United the country States and Canada. Or? Oh, really? That big? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's spreading that potential stock right throughout North America. Yeah. So, so that that is a potential. And this was, you know, my the reason I started this was not to monopolize, um, you know, the the queen stock, no, no. but as a demonstration project for the other California queen producers to tell them, How hey, they use your too. own stock. Here's how you can yeah. do this. Now, if it only took two years to do it, many of them probably would have done it. But seeing now, sure. it's taken, you know, you may take a decade to do it. They will probably shortcut and want to start with resistant stock uh, from, from sure. elsewhere, which is what Australians could possibly do. The, the only thing that's stopping you right now is the virus contamination, potential virus yeah, contamination. Yeah, we don't want to import that. Yeah, of, yeah. Of bringing bringing in outside stock, you run a risk of, of of that happening. Now, if you wind up having the strains of deforming virus that the rest of the world has, uh, then there wouldn't be a reason to um, avoid that importation, and you could just jump ahead and probably yeah. have resistant stock uh, very very quickly within a couple of years. Sure. So, um, but then but then you know just on your story about the Australian chalk brood issue. We could also import some other problems that are not varroa re right. related. So that, that's, that's why the, the you know quarantine and and you have to be very careful. And and in Australia, you are set up for doing that. You are set up for quarantining Im imports yeah. and see, or even if you're just bringing uh, semen. So that's a um, definitely a possibility. The other thing is uh, use my demonstration project on how to actually see. When we started out, yeah. It was with one colony out of 1,500. And oh. I, we, I noticed that colony kept zero counts on the mite washes and went for a whole year without needing any treatment. It was the only one right. out of 1,500. We, we called her Queen Zero because she kept getting zero counts on the mites. So we started with one colony out of 1,500 that we, saw, yeah. that we had identified as exhibiting resistance. That's what you need to do. You guys have to go out there and be doing thousands and thousands of mite washes yep. to see if indeed you have any resistant colonies in your operations right. and then treat them like gold. Okay. 
you yeah. got to breed off of them heavy and then maintain this breeding program year after year. So it's not something that most beekeepers are going to be able to want to do or be able to do. You have to have probably at least a thousand colonies to do it, sure, and you need to have some degree of, of isolation uh, for yep. your meetings. And we do we do have that available in Australia because un, unlike the US that's heavily populated right. and a lot of um, you know fertile ground, we've got pretty <laughs> desolate yeah. country uh, areas not far away. Absolutely, like. and, and one of those deserts where there's not a a, a, a feral population of bees, yeah. that's a perfect isolated mating island. You don't you don't need an ocean to create an island, a, yeah. a mating island, a desert. That's works. right. We we have them up uh, high, at high elevation in the uh, mountains, just just an hour's drive above me. We were going to start yeah. using ourselves, where um, it's too cold during the winter for honeybees, right. but during the summer it's yeah. heaven for honeybees. So that that yeah. uh, that, that would be an, another option to do. Yeah, and and so and you already covered earlier, but I'd just like to go over again. But you're creating the island, but there's still enough genetic diversity because that's important for the general health of a oh, yeah. colony. So what we do is we breed off of at least thirty queens, queen mothers a year, to maintain right. that diversity. And and it's an eyeball, easy way. We don't select for color at all. So it's a yep. full palette of cover, colors. We have queens that go all, that all the way from very, very dark to a very, clear to cordovan or, or very yellow, all different patterns. Well, that's a very simple eyeball uh, indication yep. that you're not inbreeding too much if you have right. a wide diversity of colors, okay? It's not as yep. accurate as, as doing pe you know, genetic testing, but it certainly gives you an eyeball on that, um, that you're maintaining diversity. So we, yeah, and we don't care about calling them Italians or Carniolans no, or anything anymore. I don't anymore. care it's about anything. I don't care about color or how they look or what you call them. They have to. Yep. They got to be gentle. They got to be productive, yep. and they got to keep the mites under control. That's if they can do those three things, I'm happy with them. That's right, and I've and you've uh, showed your uh, picture of you sitting at, at a box of bees open, and you're just w wearing a pair of shorts. <laughs> I, that picture, I, <laughs> that's, that's our normal working year during the summer. I, I, I had a, a Australian queen breeder visit yep. some years ago and uh, uh, called me and said, I'm coming from the airport, I'm driving up to your house. And I said, oh, great, uh, look for us at this yard, it's apiary, we're working on your way, go ahead and pull on in. We're out there working our bees, wearing our shorts and t-shirts and he pulls up in his car with the windows rolled up and just sits in there and watches us for a while. We're wondering, well, <laughs> why is he still in the car? He finally gets out and he goes, well, Mike, you won't see me working my bees that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we, we've bred for very gentle stock for, for yeah. many, many, many years. Um, and um, yeah, we've, and we have a, a, a good market for our stock um, just for gentleness. So now we've yeah. just, and we haven't had any loss in gentleness by selecting for Mite resistance. The mite resistant queens but still selecting for primarily for gentleness and and I guess productivity, yes. and and then then uh, and mite then resistance. mite resistance. First, they got to be a bee that something that beekeepers would want. So yeah, so, yeah. Um, who, who needs to work mean bees? No, no, we no, no, we have no desire to work mean. I just got back from no. Southern California, where it's all Africanized, and um, yeah, and I that's a real risk down there. And I actually had to put a veil on for one hive. That's really rare for me to ever have to put a, a, ve a veil on. And when At home, if if I put a veil on, everybody starts yelling, Randy's putting a veil on, Randy's putting a veil on, come and take a look. <laughs> so it must be bad. <laughs> it must be bad, yes, if I put a veil on, yes. <laughs> so tell me, you know, how many stings would you have to get before you put the veil on? I, I'd have to get, I'd have to get se several. Um, right. But I mean, I, I work bees in shorts and shorts and a t-shirt all day long. I may only get a couple of stings. And you know, wow. I don't try to, you know, I have, I've been beekeeping long enough that a, a couple of stings is nothing to, I, I don't feel That's right nothing. if I don't get a couple of stings. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, sure. so um, but it's so much more comfortable to work in oh, a t-shirt than weather, it is with yes. a full jacket. Ab absolutely. It's hard work. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it'll get, even though you're up in, uh, in the mountains, it still, get still gets pretty hot. warm. In the, yeah. 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 Like we get, uh, it's been 
over 40 yeah. here and it's early summer. Well, over 100 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit here and it's early summer. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, then you start talking about your, your main risk is, um, is heat stroke from just getting too hot by wearing, wearing too much clothing. And we, we see that. Um, it's very exciting uh, times here because the commercial beekeepers in the U.S. have been very much aware of my, of my research. And me yep. pointing out for some years that they might want to familiarize themselves with other treatments other than Amitraz because we knew that Amitraz was, was going to fail. They all knew that Amitraz was going to fail. And now it's right. starting to be a problem that Amitraz is not giving enough mind control. So I'm being contacted yeah. now by lar- some of the largest beekeepers on the planet now, um, very large, uh, one, one with 40,000 hives, um, just said, Randy, we're going to try going uh, free of synthetic miticides uh, this year completely. Um, another major uh, queen producer, uh, he, I just met him at a convention. I just came back from the uh, American Honey Producers Association convention uh, this last week. And a uh, yep. large queen producer, producer said they haven't, following, you, uh, working w- with me, learning what to do, they uh, haven't used uh, Amitraz now going on four years. So there are wow. commercial beekeepers that are making this shift. Now, as you understand the bee industry, most of this information is spread by cell phone and personal communication. It's not through you know, publications and stuff. Yeah. So the, sure. the cell phone communication between the commercial beekeepers in the industry is very, very rapidly um, spreading. Somebody, somebody tries something and says, hey, Randy published about this. You know, it looks kind of interesting. I tried it. And wow, worked worked really good. That spreads quick. Or if it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. That spreads quick. So, so this um, right. Uh, and this is what I tell the EPA, is that the restrictions on registering registered products are are so expensive to bring something to market that once a manufacturer yeah. has a product on the market, so like the the first we have one formic acid treatment in the U.S. registered, yep. and it doesn't work very well. There's other ones that work way better. Right. We have two Timol treatments registered. They both have problems. There's a, a better way of applying it, but it's sure. not registered. We have um, uh, one Amitraz treatment. We have um, uh, what's the other one? And one oxalic acid treatment registered. So that's hugely limiting, and there's not any financial incentive for anybody to enter the market with more things because it, the cost yeah. is so high and the return is so low. So uh, I'm trying to work with our Environmental Protection Agency to loosen it up and turn the beekeepers loose to do this experimentation themselves. With these yeah. natural treatments, we're not, there's, we're not gonna, uh, there's no unreasonable risk to the environment. So, see, now our registration is different than yours. You're under veterinary. We currently are not. They're talking about putting us in a few years under veterinary. We're under pesticides uh, regulation, Uh, okay? So they don't care about efficacy. They're not that much concerned about um, food and stuff. They're concerned about food, but it's only about unreasonable risk to the environment. And um, and the word unreasonable. So if it's not a risk, and there's already tolerance exemptions in the United States for oxalic acid in honey, for thyme oil and honey, and for formic acid and honey. So they, they're not concerned about any uh, contamination of the honey at all by these products. As, as a food as product, a food product. Yeah, not a problem. And since these substances all biodegrade very rapidly, they're natural substances, and they're only applied right. within the confines of the beehive, there's no chance of unreasonable risk to the environment as a whole. Yeah. So New Zealand, did the right thing. They said, well, beekeepers, <laughs> you're not going to hurt the environment or anybody else. Go ahead and, and use these in your in your hives. Uh, they didn't want to make them all into outlaws. And uh, so the beekeepers can now right. experiment there. And that's what they're doing. They're experimenting. Uh, one of the uh, wow. New Zealand um, manufacturers of an oxalic acid uh, strip um, asked yep. me to test and see what ratio of oxalic acid to glycerin would work best. I've just published that information and the ratio that they have been using did not work as well as the ratio uh, a different ratio 
So they're, they, they can learn and, they, and then you can quickly adapt. Whereas if you had a registered product, it would be expensive to say, oh, we screwed up. You really should change it. They'd have to do a, a new label, which is a, a pain in the uh, butt. So, so the beekeepers actually are actually the best laboratory Absolutely. to test and, and develop. Right. Yeah. And the, and the news will spread fast. The news will, will spread fast. Yes. So it's just, yes, it's, as, as you've, uh, sorry, as you've found with your breeders and, and the big operators over there, no one's being secretive about it. They're happy to spread yes. it because if everyone's protected, your own stock is safe oh, as well, it, isn't it? Helps. it yeah, everybody blames it on their neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we want to take that away as an excuse. Yes, uh, always do. But what we have learned, yeah. seen in our operation now, as we get, as once we start controlling, um, by doing large scale mite washes and identifying the few high mite colonies, those, yep. I call those mite diffusers because they continually diffuse mites into the rest of the operation. If you can identify yeah. them and eliminate the mites in those hives and replace their queens, then you don't have that, um, that mite diffusion going on all the time. And that makes, that makes mite management easier all around. We essentially are, we're not organic certified in any way, but we are using no. only organic treatments. Um, yep. And our mite management is not expensive at all. It's actually less expensive and than, that's, um, yeah, with the synthetic products. Well, synthetics are very yeah. expensive and, and certainly over here when they first, when they're only just getting registered, oh, yeah. um, man. And, and as you say, over here is the same as your APA, the APM VA. It's a slow, even with their accelerated registering process it's still expensive and it still takes yeah. time and for some reason they're still resisting oxalic acid and which is crazy. It's, it's, it's really really uh crazy yeah the, maybe the, we can learn something from new zealand by uh, opening new up zealand the, the has possibility uh, everything i've seen new zealand had the best idea right and look the beekeepers are going to do yep. it anyway <laughs> as you said why make us all criminals exactly. just embrace the the larger lab facility of of all of those bee operations yeah, so, I mean, just, just take a look at new zealand and say yep. is anybody getting hurt is the environment getting hurt so if there's no if nobody's getting hurt with them doing this what's your justification for making it more difficult in our country yeah 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 good point and and we would soon find out if people oh, were yeah. getting hurt or the environment it would be big news yeah. straight away. Okay, can you see this? Um, give it a sec. There it is. Okay, so from, from the code um, of veterinary chemical, here's the key thing. If and only if. When they put that in, that really narrows it down. So um, it's used for the purpose mentioned in the paragraph above. That means for, for control of a, of a parasite or disease. And... So that means if it's if and, you have to also have this one. The mixture is declared by the regulations to be a veterinary chemical product. As far as I know, oxalic acid has not yet been declared by the regulations to be a veterinary chemical product. That's correct. If you guys yeah. stop them from declaring it, then it would not be regulated. That's interesting. So just by them resisting is making it easier for us. Yeah, it is. If the beekeepers petition them not to declare that, as a veterinary product, then you'd be free to use it. Is that just a snapshot of a document or do you have a reference that I can look that up? Oh, that's right, from your veterinary code. Hope you have a good time with your experiment today. Yeah, well, it's oxalic acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, um, so this is a, uh, a, a dispenser bottle, uh, commonly yeah. a chemical off the shelf. If you snip the last two millimeters off the end it's just the right size that when you squeeze it it puts out five milliliters of solution every second so we use a a, back, a backpack garden sprayer to put apply oxalic acid dribble for a large yeah. scale for for many colonies it's very very quick it takes 10 sure. seconds per hive to to treat them for the small scale beekeeper this is really really slick very easy to just go zoop 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 
it takes you 10 seconds to treat 10 frames of bees. You'll see them, they'll show a syringe or something. A syringe yeah. is really difficult to use. Uh, very, very awkward. This, this is far, far easier, and they're readily okay. available. But you have to modify yeah. the tip just slightly to make the opening just slightly larger. Okay. So I haven't published that yet, but I'm going to have to, I'll have to put that out soon. Yeah. So I've got it here first, an exclusive. You, ha you have an exclusive, and I'm heading out right now to use this to, uh, to do the, the testing. What, what I'm, have you seen my oxalic titration, what I do? So can you see what, I'm, what I got here? Yeah, I've got it, right. Okay, so this is titration in a lab. What I do is I set up a test tube like this with a, an in indicator, and then, yes. hang on, let me go to the next one. I drop a bee into it. If the bee has had any oxalic acid um, residue on its body, it changes color. Right. So it went from blue towards greenish. It'll go all the way to uh, orange. Let's see. Okay, so it'll go all the way to, th to this color if it has a lot, uh, like 100 micrograms on its body. Right. And then I drop in a measured calibrated titrant drop by drop until the uh, color goes back to the original color. And... Um, so here's, I get calibrate, I mix up a solution of distilled water so that exactly you have a solution that has 100 micrograms uh, per milliliter. And I put that in there. And now I know there's exactly 100 micrograms and it changes from this color, which is your reference color, to, to that color. And then my titrant, I set up so that one drop equals 10 micrograms. So it should take 10 drops to change it back. So this is with nine drops of titrant. You can see it's not quite back to here. 10 drops, mm -hmm. it exactly matches what the starting. 11 drops goes over. So that shows how precise this is on measuring the number of micrograms on the bee's body. So what I'm doing now is I'm going out to, I'm testing dribble. Um, you're gonna probably hear to use sugar. We don't use sugar anymore, we use glycerin. The question is what proportion of glycerin? Um, yep. And um, I think we've been doing, I think too high a proportion the last few years. So we're reducing it tremendously. So I go out now, I dribble colonies with the two different concentrations. Then I go back after an hour, pick 10 bees out, and I titrate them, Imagine. and I see how many micrograms are on their, their bodies, and get a data sheet like this. This shows how many micrograms per bee there are on their bodies. And then I can graph it out. Okay, so now you can see okay. right here, at one hour after you dribble, and after 20 hours after you dribble, there wasn't any, any difference between the 5% uh, solution and the 40% glycerin solution. So we have been applying with more glycerin than, than necessary, which has an adverse effect uh, on the bees. So right. um, I'm gonna go out right now and do several more hives and get more data on this yeah. um, to look. So I can see five hours exactly you can see the range some bees have a lot of so this is micrograms so uh -huh. ideally you want it somewhere theoretically all the registered application methods for oxalic acid apply yep. 100 micrograms per bee 100 but that's that's the theoretical in reality okay. you rarely get that 100 so here here's two bees actually got 120 but okay. most of the bees will have much much lower amounts than the theoretical application, no matter what method you do it. But All right. just so you know that the, the theoretical ideal dose is 100 micrograms per bee. If you're up in this 40 to 60 range, that's looking pretty good. So this looking like maybe we're a little bit low on, on this dose uh, right here. And then by 20 hours, it's, it's still staying on the bees. So th this is telling us that even this low level of, of glycerin is still maintaining yep. it on the bees. It's not falling off the bees. It doesn't take 40% glycerin to hold it on the, on the bees. You Aussies have this monster learning curve. Yeah. On, it's not just like following a recipe. You can follow a recipe, but to really understand this stuff, um, yeah. this, is, this is what everybody follows in the United States. Uh, of my research, they've been using, and in Europe, they've been using oxalic acid for many years. They are really, really interested in this data for the vaporization application, for the dribble application, for the extended release application. I'm the only one 
doing this stuff. I'm the only one in the world titrating. So glycerin doesn't have a deleterious effect on the bees that we know of? The, the problem is if you, when you use the sugar in the solution, the bees tend to eat it, and that has a right. deleterious effect. So they don't like to taste internally, the yeah. So, so I have not actually titrated their guts. I could probably do that to see whether or not they actually eat it. But I know that they tend to avoid glycerin. They don't like to touch it with their mouths. So sure. um, my, my guess is you uh, minimize. The, the only reason for adding the sugar is to create a humectant to absorb moisture. Okay. It's not, right. not to make it attractive to the bees. It's to make a, create a humectant. Yeah, I and mean, you don't want them to eat it. You no, you don't want, want it on their it. surface. So the, so the glycerin is an alternative method. So, um, but this is the data. My sons are out right now. They're going to dribble um, 1,500 hives in the next couple of days. Uh, so wow. they are very eager to get these results to see what to, uh, to do. So we're going to probably do an efficacy test actually on actual mite drop um, this afternoon too. So I'll get both the titration data and and efficacy data. Because it's making the operation more efficient if it's right. working better. Yeah. yeah. The glycerin, the bees in cage trials, when I dribble them the glycerin, they don't like it. It makes them kind of sticky. They stop eating for a day. Um, so by reducing the glycerin, we can make it easier on the bees and still have the same effect of acting as a humectant. And it's cheaper too. Excellent. Wow. That's exciting stuff. Yeah. So this is the kind of applied research that I do that virtually nobody else is doing. So that to me is so much more uh, encouraging than all of the breeding programs that seem to be focused on particular right. traits because they're never <clears throat> going to get there. They've been trying that a for long a long time, time World, too. Haven't worldwide. They? And this is very interesting yeah. of why after all these years of, and <laughs> there just was an $11 million grant awarded to a research team to try to work on mite resistant stock. But eleven million right. dollars would have gone a long way. <laughs> a long yeah. way in my, in my <laughs> operation. But I mean, yeah. Uh, it would take us a long time to spend a million eleven million dollars. So um, yeah, I'm showing how to do it for, you know, a hundred man hours a year. Okay, it's roughly what we have in the selective breeding uh, program. Uh. So uh, Wow, imagine if you could multiply that by yeah. 10. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, do, it's a, doable, uh, a doable thing. As you say, and, and the land mm -hmm. island to make progress yeah. in it. So there's, there's the opportunity here for queen Absolutely. breeders and commercial yeah. operators to really emulate your success and spread it wide before we've got those viruses. Right. It's, with rural showing up, there's going to be a lot of beekeepers in Australia, just like in every other country, as, as they were in the yep. United States, that are reluctant to change, are un, unwilling to adapt quickly, or think they can do it this yeah. way, and many of them are going to go out of business, okay? Yep. Um, many of them are going to have a really hard time. But back to your word, opportunity. What that does, that creates an opportunity for those who are ready yeah. to move. So what we see in the United States is the old generation who weren't re who were resistant, they all went out of business. The rest of them are right. hanging on, but they complain all the time. Their kids, <laughs> who are my son's age, who are taking over the operations, well, they grew up with Faroa. So that's... So, yeah, they don't know yeah, any so different. So they don't have that baggage, you know, hanging on to old ways. And yeah. they are much more innovative than their parents uh, run, in, in running the operation. Yeah. So um, uh, sure. I get more calls from the next generation than from the older generation because they, they say, hey, right. you know, this is a reality. We don't talk about the good old days of Varroa because we don't remember them. And uh, <laughs> let's just yep. get on here and, and, and be successful. So if yep. you Australians can look at this as an opportunity, um, uh, Varroa yeah. made beekeeping much more profitable in the United States. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Explain well, it reduced that. reduced the supply of bees for almonds, which drove the pollination price way up. Right. It, uh, oh, plus it wiped out, oh, well, integrated with that is that it would have wiped out the feral colonies that were free Temporarily, it's going to wipe out your feral population, which will make things easier for you. 
um, eventually yep. the feral population will will rebound. Reestablish um, because of the press um, talking about the problems with bees. The public became aware of it, and um, yeah. there was a huge demand for hobby beekeeping, which makes it uh, yes. profitable for those of us who supply queens and nucleus colonies um, to supply yeah. uh, that market. And, um, yep. and you're going to also have a market now, uh, which may, may occur when some of your beekeepers start using synthetic chemicals and others maintain more organic treatments. Well, now right. Australia's really had a, always had a good name for its pesticide or miticide free wax and miticide free honey. You're going to now have honey, yeah. a choice to capitalize on that market and say, oh, my, my honey is miticide free. My wax is miticide free. So sure. that's another business yeah. opportunity. Is it? And I'm seeing it in the recreational field too, the, the reluctance of a lot of the older generation to make oh, yeah. change. But having said that, there's still a lot of the old guys are keen on uh, new technology and any discoveries. So there's still the element in the older generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know they've got skills to pass on to the new beekeepers. Yeah. But in Australia, we've all got new skills to learn fast. Oh, yeah, everybody does. But, it's, but still, yeah. even after having Varroa all these years in the United States, there are tons of people every year buying bees unaware that they need to control Varroa. Tons, tons uh, yeah. of them. And this is like, we actually refuse to sell nucleus colonies to some people. But we'll ask them, what, do you, what plans do you have? They say, they, they say, this is our first year, our first time. And I said, okay, what's your plans for Varroa management? Huh? I said, and then we go, you know what? We don't, yeah, we don't, we don't want to sell anything to you. Go get educated. Yeah, um, yeah so it's, and it's, yeah. it's unfortunate. You'd think that, w that everybody would be aware of this in the United States by now, but no, that's not the case at all. Uh, well, as, as I've uh, noted in the Australian um, experience over the last 17, 18 months, is that if it's not in the headlines and the only reason it gets in the headlines is because someone's dying or or a massive yeah. drama it just doesn't get reported and, and you know i talk to a lot of people too and they say oh yeah i remember reading about that that's all over now though yeah. isn't it i thought well yeah they're not killing hives anymore but <laughs> we've we've got a new reality you to have, deal you with have a very much yeah, a new reality and um it right. probably won't it won't be bad initially, but then when it gets into the feral population and they start collapsing and more mites drift comes up, it's yeah. going to be very difficult for a year while the feral population yeah. is collapsing. And then right. while there's, as long as there's, you have neighboring beekeepers who are not adequately controlling the mites, there's a lot of drift of, Creating of mites mite from, from, from other apiaries. And that's a, an issue. Once, so it yeah. may take a while for things to settle down. Right, so we're in for a, a bit yes. of pain. Um, I know uh, in the areas where it first um, hit, so around Newcastle and Central Coast, uh, where they killed pretty much every colony uh -huh. out there, there were still tons of ferals. Yes. The baiting program failed abysmally. Um, and, you know, I, I talked to the uh, big, there were a couple of big clubs in those areas with hundreds of members. They've still got a lot of members, which is yeah. really encouraging. And now at least the one thing that came from the DPI is that, you know, we've got a period here that we can repopulate, get good at beekeeping with mites before we've got the viruses. And so at least that's a positive side coming from the yeah. authorities. And so now we've got to restock and there's people that will drop out, yeah. of course. Uh, they just don't want to deal with it. And I know of a lot of beekeepers that are just packing up the bags. Uh, they don't want yeah. to face it. And some of them are you know, older and just they don't want right. to deal with it. Uh, they've had the golden yeah. years. And, and well, you, you're always going to get what I call a feral beekeeper mm -hmm. that does yeah. nothing. But the rest of us yeah. just have to embrace, right. learn and apply the, the lessons that's it. from it's, it's not that other countries. hard to control Varroa. Uh, and you can do it yeah. without using synthetic miticides. There is a definite yeah. learning curve. You, uh, one, your sure. lack of a brood break in most areas makes it a bit more difficult. 
But I can tell you right now, four treatments, uh, organic treatments a year, you can completely control Varroa. The treatments don't have to be expensive. Right. Well, the non-registered treatments <laughs> don't have to be expensive <laughs> and just <laughs> apply very quickly. It's, it's, it's um, yep. you know, d Not that we're encouraging any of you to do these non-registered right. treatments, but keep your eyes open for anything that right. can work. Uh, your opinion on this uh, about forcing a brood break, uh, caging yeah. a queen, for instance, for a period of time, is is that a doable I thing? I just got Probably. back from I'm thinking not in a commercial. Um, a couple of weeks ago, speaking there, talking to a bunch yep. of commercial beekeepers, and across the board, they are doing that. Uh, many of them doing it twice a ah. year, once during the winter, caging the queen for a month during the winter and then releasing her, and then once during the summer, finding the queen in every damn colony. They have special cages. They have some pretty cool cages. They have a, um, a cage there. Um, it's about this, this big square, and it's yep. shut, it has an imprint of, of comb in the plastic on the back, so the queen can, they can draw out the combs, the queen can lay eggs. But they keep yep. the lid down tight enough that the workers cannot draw the comb to full height. And what they do after if, uh, um, the larvae have grown for a couple of days, they, t they remove them. And then the queen lays an egg ah. in. So that queen remains, continues to lay eggs in there, but no workers hatch out and no mites reproduce. reproduce. And that keeps the, the bees will accept their queen. They consider themselves queen right, and they will accept their yes. queen when you let her out later on. Whereas if you don't allow that queen to lay, it's, it's more difficult. So anyway, they're learning all kinds of things about caging queens. Now, for me, you know, with a couple of thousand hives, that's not, that's not going to happen. That's not doable. <laughs> we're not. We're, but in, no. in uh, France, I mean, if, if you got 150, 200 hives, you're a commercial beekeeper. So. Yeah, that's right. It's very, yeah, different, very different in Europe. In, in Europe. Yeah. So. And so a couple of hundred hives, 150 hives, that's actually a manageable yeah. operation to to. I'll I'll have to chase yeah, that up. I've not heard of that France, one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I could. I could handle that. Living in the sub, southern okay. Provence. <laughs> um, yeah. So any, uh, anyway, uh, for the hobbyist, yeah, that's that's a possibility. Um, but again, yeah. because we don't have brood breaks often here up the coast, up in Queensland, we've got a flow. Uh, you know, there's different periods when the flow stops, but. We don't have a fixed flow period, like I note in a lot of the right. Northern Hemisphere, where you can count on certain flows. Uh, we can have flows virtually all right. year here, and the queen just keeps laying, they yeah. keep producing. And that's even right down to Sydney and uh, on the coast side. And I'm in the foothills of the mountains outside Sydney, and my um, brood break might be a couple of okay. weeks. That's, that's pretty much the same uh, as us, us here. We used to have a, 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 right. about a month and a half, uh, 40 years ago, as climate changes now, yeah. we're down to you know a couple of weeks, uh, maybe. Uh, yep. There's an occasional year where there's no brood break. Um, if we're lucky, we get a, we get a month now. So and then as soon as we go down the hill, uh, there's there's no brood break uh, in in lower part of California. Yep. So we're, we're not we're California is not that much different than much of Australia. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah, yeah, which is good yeah. for us because we're we're learning yes. from the best there. <laughs> Yeah, you also learn from uh, the worst yeah, too. Excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, true, true. Um, I I, uh, I just want to show you a picture. This picture came in from. Um, it's the, here we go. One Let's of the now. yeah. You can uh, club members, Whoa. and I think they're drones. And she says, uh, "It's I'm just a newbie, but I took these pictures of some bees. Is this deformed wing virus?" This is yeah, interesting. This is I had a last... commercial beekeeper in New South Wales just send me pictures too of drones right. with deformed wings. He said that he has seen it before and he didn't think, as far as he's known, there's no deformed wing virus. To a beekeeper in America, we'd say, yes, deformed wing virus. We don't normally see it on the drones. We normally see it on workers. On the workers. So I don't know if you got something else going on there in Australia or not so that um, would, but uh, right it, that would be like, rare for us to see i couldn't that find any reference uh here 
Yeah, I couldn't find any reference for whenever I do a search for deformed wings on bees or on drones, it always refers to DWV. Yeah. So that, and, those would be very and, easy to put those bees on dry ice and get them to somebody uh, with PCR to uh, to sample them. Yeah, and, we've got to get them to a lab. That would, um, I would strongly encourage right. you to do somebody to do that um, just to find out whether you actually have deforming virus there. Yeah, I've, I've uh, emailed back to say, have you still got those oh, yeah. drones? <laughs> we want to get those to a lab. I don't think we're at a state, hopefully we're not at a state where, oh shit, we've got deformed wing virus. We want that little honeymoon yeah. period before we get it. Um, but interesting that you've said someone else has noted it. And I didn't know that it was uh, that deformed wing virus is normally only the workers not, not only are you saying you, you never see just don't see it that much in, in the drones you normally see it, normally see it in the workers. okay and the right. th funny thing is the deformed so wing virus else. is a relatively common insect virus it's not a, just a honeybee virus so right. why right. it's not already in australia at least at a level of detection now that that may that may change yeah. you have a lot of de viruses around that are are latent um you and you just don't see them much when we add the mite to the equation yeah. it may uh, they may become prevalent so um you'll see. that's the key key difference so there could also be viruses that are in a, the australian environment that maybe isn't anywhere right. else that will then surface as a result right. of varroa and as there well. are viruses that you don't know you have if you don't have a um yeah the pcr um the um, the template to put in, you can't identify yep. that virus. So we keep discovering new viruses that are affecting the bees that nobody even knew that that we had. We just came up with a new one, just uh, discovered uh, um, this oh, a couple months ago. And then there was a uh, Dr. Nancy um, uh, uh, Dinocox Foster just presented Apis filamentous virus, which has always been considered to be a benign virus in the bees there all the time she's saying it's causing major yeah. problems to the both the honeybees and the native pollinators in the state of utah and causing uh, colonies to collapse so that's a brand new one this is a um that virus has been on my radar just out of curiosity how can it be so benign well it's it's it right. may have a variant now that may we may be facing a new epidemic of a, a new virus now ah uh. It, it's just going to be ongoing. As as we found out, um, you might have known before at Apamondia recently, it, it was Iran that was and talking I just, about I just, massive I'm, I'm losses. I'm going to be speaking on Zoom in Iran soon, okay? okay. And I've been asking the researcher who's arranging this, I asked him about that in particular. He said he wasn't concerned about it. It didn't seem like he, I said, you know, what, what's the update on that? And he said, no, nah, they're not, they're not seeing anything. So, yeah, no, it was very scary at Ipamandia hearing that. Yeah, he didn't, it did sound he scary. He didn't have that, that scare at all. So, um, yeah, interesting. Ah. <laughs> and, and remember at the same time, that same uh, talk, someone from Canada mentioned that they were having massive they losses. They were, and, and, and I, now I'm it. wondering whether that might be the filamentous virus that's happening up there. Um, there, there are clearly virus issues. I have a, a friend who has a machine that instead of identifying viruses of species, it just counts the number of virions there are per bee, how many yes. particles there are per bee. And uh, when we were having these high losses in Canada and uh, parts of the United States early this year, I phoned him up and I said, okay, so what are you seeing on your samples? What's your total vi virus count? Don't tell me species or anything else. What's the total right. virus count? He said, oh, it's off the charts. He's, he's like, he's never seen it. I go, well, okay, well, that understand, explains why we're having problems up there. Now, we don't know if it's a new virus um, uh, that we have identified, yeah. whether it's a new variant of an existing virus or some combination or what, but viruses are pretty much invisible to beekeepers yeah. and you don't see what's, what's happening, um, but they definitely can cause, cause problems. So the, the labs just need to be open to looking at any rise and any rise at all and yeah. with pcr you're not going to see that because that that, no, that, that technique doesn't do it he, he uses a machine invented by the uh his brother in the u.s army um 
for the for the army had a has a program to identify unknown diseases in army personnel if there's in battle somewhere and somebody gets sick they have to identify it so yeah. the, his brother invented this machine so he he got a copy wow. of the machine um, and uses it for uh, beekeeping and he does sampling uh, takes samples and, and analyzes samples from many commercial beekeepers yeah brilliant I wonder if no, you've got you those machines over here oh no. really that sounds like something that should be everywhere and that's it's a valuable interesting tool because the, we haven't been able to demonstrate that the machine can actually identify viruses to species, there's not much interest in it in the United States. But I find it very interesting, and he and I both agree, I've, I've known him for years. If you just look at your total yeah. variant count per bee, viruses have a cost. Yeah. If your variant count starts getting up there, uh, it's usually that the, the, they say the uh, ten, 10 to the... 11th 10 to the 9th is a billion copies per bee 10 to the 11th uh, is a hundred billion copies per bee 100 billion wow, yeah. billion virus copies in a bee yeah. with pretty much any virus it takes a toll on the bee the viruses um, you know, it takes it. metabolic energy yeah. to produce them and then it has yeah it hurts the bees so when you start seeing uh, samples of bees with ex extremely high virus counts, independent of the species of virus, it, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, and that's that's not even with um, the effects right. of varroa weakening exactly. the immune system. And the yeah. other thing people leave so, out is the the wound also gets contaminated by by bacteria. Ah, ah and yes, the, of course. In the insect bodies. When they're fighting pathogens, their immune system has a problem saying, wow, do we fight bacteria or do we fight viruses? Because there's two different methods of fighting them. So it yeah. works against yeah. the, the bee. So it's, it's, it's a, Varroa has a bunch of Hit effects on, on the bees. Yeah. Now here's the, here's the good news for yeah. you. I've had PCR done on a number of, uh, uh, for the last few years on a few colonies. So I have them take a sample from the Natural resistant colonies and then colonies yeah. right next door that have low mite levels but due to treatment and the virus levels in the natural resistant colonies are orders of magnitude lower than the ones in the treated colonies so that's wow, really that interesting is exciting. how we actually our, our mite resistant colonies are often the best most productive hives in an apiary because they don't have yeah. all the associated problems with associated with varroa, because they keep varroa counts so low by themselves, um, they're healthier colonies yeah. like you yeah. know, back in the old days. They're just not doing the battle, right. constant, the battle constant battle for survival, right? So that's got to flow on to all sorts of things like the uh, studies being done on nutritional deficit causing um, delayed or impaired mental um, development so then they, they don't become good foragers mm -hmm. and and all those other things that cause a colony yeah. decline um, so if they're strong and healthy and well fed surprise surprise it's the you're ideal strong, situation healthy and well fed you do better yeah. yes <laughs> try it yourself <laughs> yeah yeah there's a shock without right. drugs <laughs> with you and oh yeah follow and up. Uh, you guys are more. in for a learning curve yeah you want Good, accurate information. You, you want to get information that people actually know what they're talking about. There's going to be a lot of people on the internet. You're right. going to have government agents. You're going to have people talking who've never, you know, have never seen a Varroa mite. Nobody who's never seen a Varroa mite should be yeah. talking about <laughs> managing Varroa. Um, yeah, you need, to, you need right. to be talking right. to people who have lived, lived, not only live with Varroa, but six, are successful. So people ask me about you know talking to beekeepers who I talk to. I want to talk to beekeepers who drive new pickup trucks. New pickup trucks. Because they're making money. <laughs> I don't want to talk to the beekeepers yes, who are complaining right. all the time. I want to talk to the beekeepers who are making yeah. money. Because that's the yeah. ones I can yeah. learn from. They're the success. Okay. okay. You're going right. to have this in Australia. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you right now, the ones making money are going to be very quiet. Okay? Ah, yes. <laughs> You're going to get a lot we'll of noise from the out. ones who are complaining and winning government handouts and winning help and blaming it on this and blaming it on the other yeah. thing. The ones who've got it figured yeah. out and making money, they're just going to quietly go about their their way. So you got to look at the pickup trucks. 
<laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Good tip. <laughs> Is there perhaps any little final tips that you can offer recreational beekeepers in our environment in this new world or uh, encouragement that yeah, you can offer? Yeah, even with the registered treatments, if, especially if you get oxalic acid registered, you can do a rotation of treatments. On my website, go to the first year of beekeeping, and that gives you a good idea on, on what varroa management in your in, environment Um if you're willing to tweak the label a little bit or stretch the bounds, it gets it gets easier. Cause, um, but um, there's no reason why a hobby beekeeper has to throw their hands up. It's it's straightforward how you can manage varroa in your hive. Yeah, and if you've only got one yeah. or five hives, it's no big. It's deal. not big. Everyone, I've put a link to Randy's website, uh, scientificbeekeeping.com. It's a wealth of information, very well worth following, and uh, gives you the best tips on doing washes, and not with alcohol right. so much. I've never liked the idea of having a, a container of a flammable liquid where you can't see yeah. the flames right next right. to your smoker. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. So I do the, uh, the soapy yeah. wash method the way Randy has developed. Now he yeah. uses Dawn dishwashing liquid. It is available in some places in Australia, but our equivalent is Fairy okay. dishwashing liquid, available at Coles and Woolworths it and has supermarkets. To be a high sudsing uh, so, uh, detergent, not a, not a not a powdered dishwasher detergent. So that's the interesting contrast that I've noted is that the authorities are saying you want low sudsing detergent. And they're even using front loader. Oh my uh, God! How washing. Oh, the degree <clears throat> of stupid information I'm hearing from the authorities in Australia <laughs> just continues to blow my mind. I bring. I have a whole article of testing different detergents on my website. Why don't you forward that to yes. the authorities? Uh, I okay. will. I will. Um, but yeah, we want high sides in. Can you explain we why don't that really is? We know exactly what it is, but apparently it's the surfactant. My best guess, a guess only, is that um, in order, to, uh, it, it, you can't drown a varroa mite, very difficult. Even in 50% alcohol, they, they'll survive a long immersion. So you can't drown a mite because they, they clamp down right. their, uh, their spiracles, their, their breathing holes. The, the, yep. the high sudsing detergent, the reason it's high sudsing is that it has a very strong surfactant property. It breaks the, water, the surface tension of the water. That apparently is what allows the water to get into the, the uh, trachea and, and cause death. Yeah. Um, so, so like we see it with, same with the, with the bees. When you put the bees, if you put bees underwater for a minute and dump them out, yeah. they survive just fine. If you add detergent sure. to it, sudsing detergent to it for a minute, they don't survive. So it's, it's not the drowning, it's, right. it, it, the, it has to do, my best guess is the surface tension uh, that, that makes it happen. So yes. that's why certain detergents work and some don't. And I'm amazed at your authorities would, what they're doing, they, they're pulling, because something makes sense to them, they pull things out of their ass and say, oh, this makes sense to us, but ask yeah. them for the proof. supportive evidence. Anytime anybody yes. tells me anything, I say, oh, could I please see the supportive evidence of that recommendation? And you'll be amazed how much, yeah. how many recommendations you're going to hear with that, that they will not be able to give you supportive evidence. Anything that comes out of my mouth, I'll either say, I don't know, or as I just said, my best guess, but I won't say it as a fact yeah. unless I have supportive evidence. That's what science right. is about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, set out the experiments, get results, yeah. ask you're more gonna questions. Hear lots of beekeepers and quote authorities. If if they don't answer a lot of questions, with, I don't know. That means they don't know. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, you, if yep. you ask me questions, you're going to hear me say I don't know frequently. Okay. If you don't have the guy right. isn't saying I don't know frequently, you can't trust what they say because they're just tell, no. making it up as they go. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's useless. useless. Or worse that's, than useless. That's actually yes, harmful. harmful. All right, so when you're actually doing the wash and it foams up, that's not no, a bad thing. What we do is we just use a, a makeup mirror, magna, a 10 inch makeup mirror underneath the cup. Yeah. So you look down, it magnifies the mice, it makes it really easy to see. So, um, yeah, just don't. 
I've started doing that on your advice. There you go. One of these. So, uh, and it makes it so, so much, much easier. easier. You don't have to yeah. trick your neck no, up. No you d and, and you don't have to put your glasses right. on. You can use yep. one of these. They're only a couple of dollars at, at, at the supermarket. And, you know, don't be embarrassed going into the makeup <laughs> aisle of the supermarket to get your, you just say you're buying it for your there wife, you you're fine. <laughs> and it makes life easy. So that's like Randy's website, scientificbeekeeping.com is full of gold. So definitely go over there and there's pages and pages and pages of valuable information there. All right, I, I think we'll wind it up. I've taken so much of your it's time. Been nice talking with you, Mike. Randy, and I greatly and I'm, appreciate I'm sure it. You'll, you'll, uh, and we'll continue the conversation another time. Yeah, you guys are going to be definitely. On a, on I look forward to meeting you again. In the next few years, so there's plenty of information to share. Yeah, we've uh, we've definitely got a lot to learn from you specifically and others. So thanks very much, Randy. I greatly okay, appreciate it. Good luck to you all out there. And uh, thanks very much. Okay.